Gentlemen, welcome back to the T. Shanley starting a business, building a brand vlog. This one, big number, 292. So, good news. The serum, back in stock, back in action, and I just wanna show you something, all right, all right. So, Kelly sent me this weird picture today, right? <laughs> Basically, showing the new serum, the viscosity, versus the old serum. So, as you can see, there was definitely a difference. Um, he sent me that picture, and I'm like, uh, what is that? And then, 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 then I figured it out. Anyway, so that is good news, gentlemen. We got serum back in house. Things are about to start cranking again. Um, something else before I tell you a little bit about Target and all of the business questions, because here's the deal. Today is primarily going to be spent answering your business questions. Um, if you've got a business question, down below, start it with business question and ask your question. Each week we try to get to a few of them. So, uh, what the hell was I, what, what was I even talking about? Target. Target is what I was going to talk to you guys about. In last vlog, I mentioned, um, for those of you who've been watching for a while, you know, we went to Target, or I should say, we, we basically applied to be carried in Target stores. The way that it happened, you know, I don't know exactly like all like logistically in terms of like who reached out to who, but we got to pitch. Each year, Target essentially allows people to pitch them on why they should be in Target stores. And then if Target's like, yeah, this sounds good, they make a big purchase order, they buy your stuff, they, they put it on the shelves, and then you hope, <laughs> you cross your fingers that it sells through so that they don't kick you out. Well, we pitched, I thought we'd had an incredible pitch. I think the whole team worked really super hard. We thought that that was going to, we thought it was gonna happen. You know, even after we like pitched, Target, we thought, you know, this is definitely something that they're gonna be interested in. You know, not only do we have amazing products, we systemized everything, right? We got level two, level three, level three, everything's in a kit, and, and that's the secret sauce of T. Shanley. And we also brought a lot of, you know, awareness to the table. You know, Target wants to move products. They wanna move inventory. And so, you know, we thought, hey, with, with the amount of social presence that we have and our ability to sort of let people know, hey, we're in Target, go check it out in Target, we thought that that was going to be, you know, what they wanted to see. And so, you know, once you pitch, it was, I think, like a 30-minute pitch, and then you're just waiting. You're waiting, you're crossing your fingers, knowing that a lot of your competition are pitching. You know that there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. So we thought that we were gonna be good. Like, if I was a betting man, I'd say 90% I was sure, like, yeah, they're definitely gonna take us. I felt like our, our, our offering was str that strong. <laughs> Good thing I didn't bet, right? So, so we were all like, kind of like waiting and like, okay, because the, the truth is if Target would have said, yes, let's do this, it would have been a needle mover for our business and our company, right? Because the Target purchase order, depending on how many SKUs, depending on how many stores they were gonna roll it out in, you know, it could have been, you know, you know, upwards of, you know, $5 million, $10 million, like, they're, they're, like, like it, it, it's a stair step as opposed to a gradual, you know, climb as we have been doing from the beginning in terms of our growth as a company. And so we really thought that it was going to be and make a dramatic impact to our bottom line. And so that's another reason why we felt like, okay, this is really something that, that is going to be good for our business. Well, as you have guessed, or I've mentioned, Target passed. They passed on us. They said, hey, thanks, but no thanks. We're not, we're not interested in rolling you out. We're like, why? You know, what, what, what was it? When we really did our, our digging, we, we had a follow-up call sort of just to say, hey, you know, can you please like, let us know like, what's going on or why you didn't like us or, or think that we were right for your store? The main thing and the main reason is that Target didn't think that their customers would spend 25, 35, 45 dollars for a skincare system. They just simply thought that it was outside of the budget or the, the buying patterns of their consumer. And that ultimately was the main reason why they said thanks, but no thanks. So Kelly, when he got the news, was super bummed out. He was upset for a while. I think he was like pretty kind of like depressed almost. And I really feel like Kelly was thinking that it was a, 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 a defining moment for T. Shanley. It was our opportunity to really like plant our skincare flag in the ground at a big box retailer. And when they passed, he was, he was upset, he was bummed out. When he told me, when he told Rob, I was less bummed out. I was actually relieved, if I'm being completely honest. I was, one, okay, so let me, let, me, let me back this up a little bit. 
One of the things that Tiege Hanley has lacked at times in the past has been focus. We take our eye off of the prize, off of our goal, our number one goal, and our business. And when we get distracted by shiny objects like, ooh, let's do this, or ooh, let's do that, right? What happens? It takes resources from what we need to be focused on and, and, and we spend them other places, not just financially. I'm talking about like human capital and bandwidth from a, from, a, from a corporate perspective. If somebody's handling retail, think about this. If all of our people right now are focused on you know, direct to consumer online, if we've got to now all of a sudden like have a whole nother like wing or branch of, of target or retail, think about that. Like how do you, like, like logistically, how do you do it? Fulfillment, how do you do it? Especially when we come off of something like the serum, right? Where there was a huge logistical mess up, deodorant, huge issues, you know, with getting that produced. Like how do we in good conscience and good business faith take on something that massive with as much as stake? Because that's the, that's the other thing. Like if you do it, right? you better not screw it up. Can you imagine rolling out for something like that and we can't fulfill a purchase order or we run into issues? Like, like don't worry about like your current business, but just like that aspect, it would have been horrible. And so with that in mind, the lack of attention or the focus that I personally feel that we need to focus and, and figure out right now, and that is our, our current business model, adding products, getting new products launched, really focusing there on our messaging and customer acquisition, and retention, that is what we were built for. That is what we are trying to basically scale. This retail would have been nice because it would have been a big chunk of money, you know, annually, hopefully, but here's the other problem. If it doesn't sell through, Target's gonna give you basically your walking papers. Like, all right, it, it didn't work. You gotta sell through your inventory and then you gotta take whatever you don't sell back. You know, can you imagine like the financial burden on that, on, on a business with that scenario as well? You know, we know a few people that have been like kicked out of Target and then asked back to Target and then kicked out of Target. I mean, it's a dance. It's a dance that you've got to do if you want to basically get in bed with a big box retailer like Target. You know, do we still want to eventually? Yes, of course. We think they're a great partner, but are they the only partner that we potentially are looking at? The answer is no, of course not. You shouldn't have all of your eggs in one basket. But that being said, I'm relieved. I am really happy that we did not get into Target. So now that we can, now we can focus on growing our business and doing the things that we need to do really well and starting to run faster than we have in order to grow our business. Because there are things and aspects that we are still struggling to figure out. There are other things that we're not really that great at that we're trying to get better at. And so we are, I'm excited. I'm excited for the growth of T. Shanley. We have been doing really well. Some of the ads we've been doing that you guys have seen have actually been working and we've been figuring out ways to scale a bit. And so this is all super exciting. Speaking of exciting, let's talk about your amazing business questions. This first business question, ooh, I'm not, I, I'm just gonna give you my opinion, all right? You do what you need to do, Jesse Talley. He says, hi, Aaron, long time watcher, first time question asker. I just graduated from law school and I'm about to start a job at a big law firm in DC. DC is a great city, love DC. I've been there a few times. It's such a great location, right? DC is close to a lot of things. Georgetown's amazing. You know, Annapolis is amazing. Baltimore is amazing. I just love that area. Anyway, you're gonna have fun. Which provides a starting salary of right, 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 wait for $200,000. Starting salary, $200,000 thousand dollars in exchange there there's an there's an exchange coming for virtually all of your time i've also come to realize that i hated law school and i'm unsatisfied with the prospect of surrendering all of my free time to a job yet it seems ridiculous to give up such a salary at such a young age how do you determine whether money makes you happy how do you pivot your life away from something you've spent seven years college plus law school running towards uh you, that you've spent you know, all your time basically running towards. So this is such an incredible question and congratulations. Wow, $200,000, that's a ton of money. And once again, at, you're correct, at that young age, it's insane. Insane, great, 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 great job, congratulations. Now the question is, is the money worth it? You know, it sounds like you're getting cold feet in terms of, all right, like I'm done, like I got a big job, but, but, but they literally are going to own you, essentially. 
What I would say, if I were you, is to do it. Do the job and go for it. And do the best that you possibly can. And hopefully, it takes up a little less time than you think it will. But you may love the work. There's a reason why you went into law school, right? Now school and doing all that, like kind of a, kind of a bummer, right? And as you progress towards it, you know, it, it's like, all right, are you still passionate about being an attorney? Something you can answer later. But you went through the time, the energy, the expense in order to do this. You need to do it. You need to give it a shot. Now, after a few years, you may decide, you know what, this really does suck and I'm just not happy. Or you may realize, you know what, this is pretty awesome. I really love what I'm doing and I'm going to continue to do it. And at that point, now you're making like a lot more money and you've got to decide, is it worth it? Now, you know, in terms of de determining whether or not the money is worth it, in terms of time, you're too young to have that, that identity crisis, right? You've been in school for seven years. It is time to get out into the real world and give it a shot. For me, what I would think is, you know what, even if I do this or commit to, I'm gonna do this for five years or 10 years, you're still in your early 30s, right? And so at that point, if you do this for two years, how much money is that? It's like, or 10 years, that's $2 million gross that you're, that you're basically you know, acquiring. Now, the trick is in order to have options in the future, don't live up to your means. Live below your means and save as much cash as possible. Now, this doesn't mean not to splurge or buy a nice watch or something to treat yourself. You wanna do that, do it. But if you wanna basically commit yourself to this journey, you start getting all your expenses, right? And, and they start raising because it's harder to work, walk away from a career that's paying you this much or the money or the golden handcuffs as they say, it's harder when your expenses are super high, but if you've been able to sock away a ton of cash and use this as a way to save money, also, this doesn't take into consideration your, your student loan debt. If you've got debt, you gotta pay that off. Get rid of that debt. Because if you wanna do something else in the future, if you've got all this debt or you've got all these expenses, you are gonna have a whole nother hill to climb and it's gonna be much more challenging to you if you decide you know you want to stop right because you got bills and that takes all the fun out of everything but if you've been able to live below your means save a bunch of money now you've got resources that you can basically take some time to figure out what you do try different things that gives you a whole nother level of confidence a whole nother level of of potential and so for me what i would do go and get the job and kick as much ass as possible see what you can do be nice to everybody dress the part work your ass off and then later on, a few years from now, if you're absolutely miserable, then make the call. But now it's too soon. Congratulations and I'm so incredibly proud and excited for you. This is such a great opportunity and you've worked your ass off. Now try it. You owe it to, to yourself to at least try it and, and your parents. <laughs> I'm assuming your parents. The next business question is another great question. Man, you guys are bringing it super strong lately with these business questions. I, God, you guys are incredible. Anyway, it's from our friend Gelmir Lantigua. He says, hey Alpha, would you recommend a startup using a 3PL, which is third party like logistics, for, I think that's what it stands for, <laughs> anyway, to store and fulfill their orders, since leasing a warehouse can be very expensive and the logistics of having inventory delivered to your house can be, a challenge, can be challenging as well? And the answer is absolutely. You know, if you and your business is set up to basically be able to utilize a 3PL, then I, I better check to make sure what, what I'm actually saying in terms of what uh, 3PL stands for, meaning uh, 3PL, third-party logistics provider. I was right, see, I'm big brain right over here. Anyway, yeah, I think it's an amazing opportunity. You know, they are great because you take out the, the warehouse, you know, you don't need to staff it. You are paying more, obviously, to fulfill it, but you know what, this is kind of like, who cares? You know, it's easier to do that. It's, it's less expensive and less risk up front than doing like a big warehouse, having staff, you know, picking and packing. And you're right, you know, having things delivered to your house. And the other thing is it depends on how big you are to start. It also, I guess, depends on what you're selling, what you're shipping and how hard it is for you to actually fulfill that yourself. You know, when I started Pete and Pedro, it was out of my bedroom. I had everything shipped to my, my, my where, or no, yeah, it was, I had it shipped in my house, I got it, I stored it in my room, I had a you know, Dymo printer, I had a stamps.com account, and then every day I would take my box of Pete and Pedro products or, or shipments to the post office. That was a pain in the ass. 
If you are willing to spend a little bit more money in order to fulfill that and let a 3PL sort of handle it so you don't have to worry about that stuff. Like, can you imagine how much time it would take for you personally to sit there and fulfill the orders? Now, at first, when it's 10 orders, no big deal, but when it's 10, 15, 30, 100, 200, 3,000 a day, I think it's a really great idea to really kind of start a, I said really five times, I think it's a better idea to start down that road plan for success. And, and the other beautiful thing is that you're only paying for the storage that you need at that specific time. You know, and then it's typically going to be like a per pack fee that you're paying, plus shipping, packaging, stuff like that. But a lot of times it, it makes more sense, especially with Amazon, which brings us to the next question, talking about Amazon. The question is from our friend, Abul or our lifestyle. Sorry for butchering that. I don't even know if that's your name. Anyway, he says, I always wanted to ask this question. And it's a general question, not only for Tiege. If you're selling your products directly from your website, especially products with subscription, why do you need platforms like Amazon? How does that even work? Shouldn't all of the ads direct everybody to Tiege website? So this is an amazing question and one that a lot of business struggle with, you know, in terms of what do they do? Do they go on Amazon? Now, let me give you a few reasons why, even if you're a subscription model, it's good to be there. All right, the main reason is for awareness and exposure. Amazon is the biggest shopping platform out there. And if somebody doesn't know about you, goes on, searches, you know, we'll use Tiege as an example, right? Skincare for men, Tiege pops up. They could potentially buy it right there, but they also could do a Google search and go and find it elsewhere, go directly to your website and sign up like everybody else does. This is one of the reasons why a lot of people that do offer not only their products on the website, but also on Amazon, typically Amazon is gonna be a little bit more expensive so that if somebody is like going and doing the research to find and, and find out more about that product, they see that it's cheaper on your website, they sign up at your website, that is the story. So it kind of makes sense. But, uh, but yeah, awareness is, I would say awareness is probably the biggest reason. The other thing is that you can make good money. You know, the, the whole thing that we were talking about earlier in terms of just another kind of like arm of your business, you know, you are relying on, on, on like for your website, you are relying on people going directly to your website, whether or not that's them typing and, and going directly or you spending money on ads to go to your website. So Amazon essentially has done a lot of the heavy lifting, getting customers to Amazon, the marketplace. And then when somebody shops, you know, you're, you're essentially not having to pay in order to make somebody aware that your product is there. Now, the other thing is that you can advertise directly on Amazon to Amazon customers, something that T. Shanley is doing, and it's incredibly effective. You know, you got to do the numbers. You know, does it make sense? Is it worth it? Are you trying to grow? You know, for T. Shanley, we have a multi-million dollar business on Amazon. You know, we also have, you know, much more than that on you know, the, the teach.com and our current subscribers. But think about that, you know, just by putting us on Amazon, we have scaled and grew our business, just like we were talking about earlier on big box retail. It's another outlet. It's another option to sell your products. And at the end of the day, you're trying to get your products in customers' hands. As long as you do it and you can still maintain margins. Now, the truth is your margins when you sell it direct through your website is much higher than on Amazon because, well, there are a few reasons. Number one, Amazon takes a cut. The other reason is that, you know, if you're going on Prime, you're essentially eating the shipping costs. So the money you're making in terms of, you know, bumping up the price, you know, it's kind of getting, you know, eaten away anyway. And so your margins are going to be less on Amazon typically, but not 100% of the time. You've really just got to figure out what's right for your business. You know, Tiege does Prime. Pete and Pedro, no Prime. I'm like, screw that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in this business to make like little money. I want to make money. And if I give Amazon their cut and then I'm paying for shipping and like, like screw that. So for me, I'm like, I'd rather not sell it there. Come to my website, buy it there. And I also don't offer free shipping on Pete and Pedro though. I, I, you have to spend like $60. I do not believe in the whole like free shipping, free shipping, free shipping, shipping has to be free all the time. I do not buy into that methodology or philosophy, but a lot of people do. And the fact that Amazon now has created a culture with Prime 
that everybody expects shipping to be free, it does change the game. But you've just got to do the numbers, do the math, and figure out what's right for your business. But for us, it made sense to be on that incredibly large marketplace, and it's made a difference to the T. Shanley bottom line. But incredible question, and one that a lot of entrepreneurs have to face and struggle with. There are two more questions that I want to get to on this vlog, and if I didn't get to your question, you know, please copy and paste it into this vlog that you're watching, and I'll get to it hopefully next week. Um, but before I get into that, I just am going through these comments. And you know how I said in the last vlog, when it came to our, our serum viscosity, we only got like five complaints. Well, I just saw like 20 people that have commented, hey, I noticed it. And this goes back to the whole idea that you know, you're only hearing from a very small percentage of people. The majority of people are noticing, they're just not saying something, they're not commenting. And so if you've got an issue with your business, even if you hear it from five people out of thousands, it's worth investigating a little bit further. And so this is just a great example of that, honestly. All right, the next business question comes from our friend Alex Kane. He says, Alpha, uh, he says, Alpha, <laughs> he says, you've been open uh, or, uh, Alpha, you have been open up about everything related to your personal life and vlogs and in the main channel. It is healthy to be open, to be that open? Is it healthy to be that open? Does it help business? And please suggest business ideas under 10,000. So in terms of businesses under 10,000, you just Google search it. There are a ton of different businesses and business ideas, lots of different websites that are totally free to give you business ideas. You could do you know, business ideas for 5,000, 10,000, like whatever. So Google that. In terms of me being open and honest, is it helpful? I think it is. And the reason why I think it's helpful is because in the world that we live in with social media, people connect with people as opposed to brands. And when you can be vulnerable and basically just be honest with people, that connects you to them in a different way, a different, different, different way than like somebody or a brand just like advertising. And so, you know, I never, and just let me, let me, let me state this for the record, I never ever started talking about things that were hard to talk about or being honest and transparent about my life, my emotions and all that. I never set out with the goal, I'm going to leverage this, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let people see me cry and I'm going to use this in order to, you know, start million dollar empires. That, 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 that was never a thought. When I started YouTube back in 2008, it wasn't even like a thing, right? You didn't even think about businesses or making money or anything like that. It was just something that when I sort of started doing that or I just kind of let people into my life, it was amazing, the response, and it felt really good to get positive feedback like, hey, thanks, this helped me. And that's kind of what I became addicted to. I'm addicted to you know, that feedback. And the cool thing about YouTube is that the feedback loop is like super quick, right? It's like I tell you, you comment, or I get an email. And so for me, it's been very therapeutic as well. You know, me talking about things and, and addressing things and dealing with things throughout, you know, with video has been one of the things that has helped me deal and compartmentalize a lot of things that I've gone through in the past. Having an outlet like this is almost like my therapy. And a lot of times I'll watch the videos back because the video that I'm making is the video that I need or I needed back then. And so for me, it's just, it's just the only way I know how to do it. Has it helped my business? I'm sure it has, but it's helped me more than financially. It's helped me emotionally, mentally, and the fact that I feel like I truly have, whenever I meet you guys, like I feel like I've got you know, six million friends. And so, you know, is it worth it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> is it financially gonna benefit you? I don't know. So, see, see here's, the other, here's the other interesting thing about that. There are a lot of people now that start YouTube channels or whatever they're doing with the idea that I'm going to use this and turn this into a business. And that is why I'm giving information. That is why I'm posting. That is why I'm doing whatever I'm doing. You know, the truth though, is that the audience and people can smell out bullshit really quick. They've gotten good at it. Right. And so when you start with a business with the intention of, I'm going to basically give value so that they will buy something from me later. I think that's the wrong way to do it. If you've got something to say, say it. Whatever happens later, let it happen. But you've got to be pure and true with your intentions and your integrity, I think, is, is definitely at stake. And so for me, I sleep well at night and I just love being able to share my thoughts and perspective with people and even the hard times because I know, and that's the other thing. You know, I know that 
And the way that I look at things, if I'm sharing something that hurts or is painful or is my reality, if it helps one person, you know, that's worth it. You know, when I did the video talking about my colonoscopy thing, you know, I, I, I made that decision because I realized that I wasn't planning on talking about it, but it could help somebody. And if it helps one person, that is the reason why I set out to do this. And so, yes, is it worth it? Absolutely. Is it hard sometimes talking about things? Yeah, is it hard? Like I still, to this day, the video that I did, My Darkest Days, where I talk about my story with my fitness center and Linda and all that, to this day, I cannot watch that video and not cry my ass off every single time. It literally rips the scab open every time. But I've gotten more emails from people over that, email, over that video than anything. And see, I get choked up even thinking about it. But it's powerful, and for me, it's absolutely worth it. Um, so to answer your question, I'm not sure if that answers your question. It probably does. The answer is yes. Do it if you want to. If you don't, then, then don't. There are a lot of people that don't expose vulnerabilities, and that's fine too. You don't have to. But for me, it was the only thing that made sense, and I had to do what, what felt right, and, and that feels right to me. And the last business question comes from our friend Major Tyree, and this is a pretty quick one that I can answer. He says, would you recommend using micro-influencers to market a product locally? So if you got a barber shop, are you using micro-influencers? I'm not sure which micro-influencers or what space you're talking about. Would you use them to, to advertise your product? You know, would I use a micro-influencer to create an ad or some type of sales pitch that I can then use and pay ads and target geo traffic like way? Yeah, I would do that because a lot of these micro influencers are great in terms of their ability to deliver a message and talk about things. Now in terms of utilizing their platform and paying them to just advertise your barbershop locally and they're in California, no, I would definitely not do that. They don't have a big enough reach. And so, you know, I've been approached by a lot of companies that are like, hey, I'm a car dealership here in Georgia. Would you be interested in doing a promotion on your YouTube channel? It's like, no, I wouldn't because, you know, the chance, you know, when, when, when you start actually like really looking at the numbers, even on a bigger scale like I have, you know, if you have 6 million subscribers, you know, what percentage of them are US based, all right? Like 35%. And then, okay, well now you're 35%. All right, so now how many people are, you know, in your area, okay? Well, that shrinks to like, like a really small percentage. How many people in your area are my right demographic in terms of age, income level, and are looking to buy a car? Like really small. And so it doesn't make sense. And so that is my answer. How's that? Was that good? Gentlemen, that's it. I'm going to wrap things up. We love you more than our double long strap shoes. If you've got a business question, start it with business question and ask it. Next week, more of your business questions. Also some updates on some exciting Tish Hanley launches. Guys, thanks for everything. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next week.